Wonderful. So uh, let, let us begin. Um, I have the honor of serving as the Executive Director of the Yale China Association. My name is Nancy Yang Mosbach. And uh, thank you for all coming out today. I see some new faces in the room. So we're really excited that we can have a, an event that really brings out different members of the New Haven, greater New Haven community. So please sit down. We have some extra seats. There's a seat back there. There are a few seats here. Uh, feel free to uh, get comfortable with us. Um, but this is our first fireside chat with a Chicago, Chicagoan. <laughs> <laughs> you, might, very yeah. <laughs> you might think he's actually from uh, originally from Xi'an or, or a hood on your family, parts of your family. But actually, he calls Chicago home. And you do get this reference um, in the book as well. Uh, but it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, for a fireside chat with uh, Wen Guang Huang. Uh, and uh, he is a Chicago-based writer, a journalist, uh, in fact, but he works a day job with a corporation. Okay. It's an unknown corporation. <laughs> we, were, we weren't able to, to uh, Google stock that information of, about you. Uh, but he came to the U.S. in 1990 uh, to pursue a master's in public affairs and journalism from uh, in Springfield at the right. University of Illinois. And uh, he also served as a staff member of the New York Times and the Beijing Bureau. Uh, he's a regular contributor uh, to all the reputable uh, journalistic publications, the Asian Wall Street Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, Chicago Tribune, uh, South China Morning Por uh, Post, and the CPR, Chicago Public Radio. Uh, but he's began his career really as an author and translating nonfiction works, and uh, also has translated a number of books, including uh, Liao Yiwu's Corpse Walker, uh, and this is his first book, and he describes it as a family memoir. I'm really excited also because the book with the published date was April 25. Uh, today is May 8th, and it's really one of uh, our great honors to have uh, uh, Wen here with us today. And also Oprah Winfrey, also another Chicago native, <laughs> not a native, you're a Chicago transplant. Uh, Chicago has just uh, uh, picked uh, Wen's book as the book of the week. Uh, so we're really excited. It's a wonderful book, and we've had it. Many of you already have copies of it, but we are having them available for sale. And uh, one has uh, agreed to sign copies of it. Uh, so that's a wonderful opportunity. Please uh, think about uh, this wonderful book to to bring in, to bring home. Uh, but we wanted to welcome formally uh, uh, went to a Yale China Association. Uh, this is when we have an opportunity as an organization that does work predominantly in China and rural parts of China to really come up for a breath of air. Uh, to think about what is the bigger picture, what are issues that we find interesting as we do our work in education, in health, in public service, and in the arts. Uh, so it's really wonderful for us to share what we think is such an interesting book that transcends three generations and also so many of the different vicissitudinal <coughs> periods uh, in the recent history of modern, uh, modern China. So welcome Wen, and he'll share a few words. We'll do it a little bit differently from some of the other chats we've had. Uh, Wen will share a few words about him, and then I'll moderate a conversation with him for about 15 minutes, at which time you can prepare your own questions. And I think anything is, uh, any question is, is okay. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so please <laughs> prepare your questions, and then uh, we'll have a nice time of uh, discussion with the audience, and then uh, when we'll sign books for those of you who would like to bring a copy home. Uh, so prepare yourselves, and, and let's prepare for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Wen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me since we have this uh, great seating arrangement uh, we can make it inter more interactive if you want to interrupt me or have a question feel free to do so and thanks Nancy for inviting me over and as I just want to make one um, uh, thing too that uh, Professor Kang is here today it's his last day I heard at Yale uh, teaching here for how many 20 years 18. <laughs> <laughs> because the reason I'm mentioning it because uh, Nancy just mentioned the the Ali Wu book. The first time that I entered, the, decided to do some writing and then decided to translate the Ali Wu's book. And then Professor Kang was the one who smuggled the, the manuscript out and had it had it published in Taiwan. Because of him, I was able to access the the Chinese version, and we uh, I had it translated into English and. Uh, Today, actually, they just won a major uh, award in Poland. The all thanks to uh, Professor Kang. He has a book called uh, um, Confession of the Innocent in Communist China. And because we were both from Xi'an, and when I was writing the book, I read that book actually three times. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. 
Uh, I just, uh, before Nancy will do the q and I just uh, want to say that uh, this book, when I uh, uh, started out as a book, I wanted to, to, to uh, I have three purposes in mind. The first one is, like it says, it's a family uh, memoir. And because in uh, the U.S. right now, we have uh, read a lot of books about China, about families during the Cultural Revolution, including Professor Kahn's, they all had a very dramatic um, uh, impact because they're, they were persecuted personally, or their parents were persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. But this is more family things, because my family, in a way, we were the beneficiaries of the Cultural Revolution. None of my parents, that we were persecuted. But I wanted to use the ordinary person's life, their, their story, family story, to let people get a picture of uh, what China was like in the 1970s and the 80s, and up to the present, what is Xi'an is like now. In the central part of China, I'm sure most of you have visited. So that's one purpose. The other one is, um, I've been here in the U.S. for uh, 20 years, and I uh, became a citizen um, uh, in 1998. And uh, this is more, I want this book to be more of an immigrant story about how we all came over here. We tried to start a new life and you tried to get assimilated and then you tried to forget about the past and then how at a certain age you deal with, you deal with your past, your cultures, how do you strike a balance between American and with your past. So this is more to me, it is more a book about an American immigrant, how you deal with your, your cultural heritage. So uh, with that in mind, I can just, uh, we'll just talk more as we, during the Q&A, feel free to ask me any questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and, and, and some of you, who has read the book? Not yet, it's, that would have been very impressive if you had. It's <laughs> only on the book. I, I published it in for about 10 days. Uh, so in the book, you start off by sharing that you, slept next to your grandmother's coffin uh, for, for over 10 years. Can you share a little bit about why that was the case? Your grandmother was still alive. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this story, I, when I was trying to write this memoir, I picked a, a theme which I think is very metaphorical in a way. I picked the story of a coffin because it played a certain important part in our family life. It all started in 1974. 1973, actually, my grandmother was 72, and she suddenly realized that she was going to die because there was a Chinese saying saying that 73 and 84 are the thresholds in life. Most people die during that period. So she got so scared, and she wasn't sick or anything, and she insisted <laughs> that uh, she wanted to be buried, and she wanted a grand send off in a coffin, and then to be sent back to her hometown, which uh, uh, to be buried with her husband. Who had, uh, who had died about uh, 50 years before she was a widow the rest of her life. And, uh, you know, it might be a very easy thing if she were in the United States, but here in China, in Xi'an, it's a big urban city that at that time, uh, Bera was uh, banned in China. And uh, all the uh, funerals were considered something old and superstitious practices. And it was illegal to to send somebody home to a different province to get buried. So my father was a very devoted Communist Party member. When my grandmother asked for a coffin, it put him in a very difficult dilemma. And for the next 15 years, and we were struggling with this issue, in order to, my grandmother, she was so persistent, in order to, to get my father to promise that she would be buried, and she asked to have a coffin made. So my father, uh, he felt very indebted to his mother he decided to agree. So they had a coffin made, and then in the rural areas, which was very uh, common, and then you could put it in a warehouse, but in urban areas, they didn't have a place to put. So where did they put it? Next to my bed. So <laughs> I was supposed to be the coffin keeper, and it's supposed to be a very prosperous, uh, uh, an auspicious thing to do, to have a coffin made when you were still alive, and every year you add a layer of uh, black paint to it. And uh, actually it did bring a lot of luck to my grandmother. She didn't die after 16 years after the coffin was made. <laughs> but this whole thing it just changed my whole life. That's the story. I try to use this story about the coffin, how our family, uh, what we did with the coffin, and then to tell about family life in the 1970s and 80s, and how it impacted my life. From my understanding, your, your father was the eldest son, and you were the eldest grandson, is right. that correct? Right. 
So how did that play into the family dynamics, which, you know, some of, uh, much of the book talks about uh, your sister and many of your you know, very close connections with your family, your mother, and their, the relationship between your mother and father. But how did, you know, it seems auspicious that of all the children, you were selected, and, and, and also that your father had the honor of your, your grandmother living also with your family. Right. Can you share a little bit about the dynamics of being the eldest right. uh, male? Right. My father was uh, was the only male survivor in the whole family clan. My family used to be a big landowning class <coughs> near the Yellow River, and my great grandfather used to be the the court official. Uh, the the emperor gave him a lot of land, so the whole family prospered during the the, the last century. But then in the 1940s, a TB epidemic hit the whole village. We our family, uh, they, uh, one of the, the, the person married a woman from a different village, from a very wealthy family. Everybody thought that the guy was so lucky to have married this wealthy woman because the dower was so great. But it turned out that she brought TB to the whole family. And in so, uh, uh, in a very strange way, that all the male members died of uh, uh, TB. So my grandpa died when my father was only two months old. And my, my, my father had an elder brother who died at a, my grandpa's funeral. So after the whole family died, my, my dad became the only male survivor. And the, traditionally, that uh, my grandma was only 27 years old when she was a uh, widow. So in order to make sure that the whole family, the whole family name could carry on, so my grandmother never married. And then she actually raised my dad all by herself. And then famine hit the, 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 the region, and then Japanese invaded China, and uh, the life was so hard. My grandma had found feet, and certain times they backed their way all the way to Xi'an, Xi'an in the central part of China, if you, those of you have been there. And Japan, uh, the Japanese troops did not uh, reach that region. So she actually single-handedly raised my father. That's the reason why my father felt so indebted to his mother. And he had to feel like by giving his mother a proper burial, it would be the, the right thing to do to pay back. And for me, it was the, in the Confucian society, the eldest son is considered the father. If the father passed away, and then the, the eldest son is taken over. So even after my father died, I was only 22. And then my mom was here, my sister, they were all older. And then the party secretary would come in and then talk with my, about my dad's benefit the benefits stuff. They wouldn't talk to, to them, but they would come and talk with me. So it's the, the, the kind of the, the confusion, the hierarchy system. It is this special uh, status because the eldest son and my dad is the only male survival, uh, the male mem uh, member who survived the whole catastrophe. And uh, we, I was involved in the every process of planning the funeral process because I was supposed to be the one in the end who will help my father give my grandmother the proper send off. And throughout, when I was only nine or 10 years old, each time my dad, we planned something very clandestinely. We had to, we lived in constant fear because people would find out and my father's political status had been jeopardized. So we spent 15 years, we, I was always part of every plan. What if in the summertime, he, she died, what would it do? In the wintertime, what if she died, what, what kind of plan we would have? So it's like uh, I call the underground uh, a network. So we had all these different build-up networks to help with the funeral plan. That's what we did for 15 years. <laughs> so, so can you share a little bit about your grandmother's reaction to the, the dutifulness, the filial piety aspects of you and your father in terms of committing to her you know, future funeral? Uh, in part, you mentioned on one page is the conflict between uh, your mother and father uh, halfway through so the the planning process where she wants a new coat but she's your father spends all this time planning for his mother and being dutiful to to the mother but then in, in some parts doesn't provide enough in terms of your mother's viewpoint to the children and to his wife right uh, because of this this uh, funeral took up so much so much of financial resources and my, my father for 15 years before he died. Actually, he died before my grandma. That's the whole tragedy of it. And then he was so obsessed with uh, planning the funeral. It almost wrecked uh, his marriage because I was talking to my sister the other day we were just reminiscing. Like for the later part of his life, they almost were living in separate rooms, separate in the way. So my mother felt like uh, um, 
she, uh, my father would, should worry more, should have more worried more about the living rather than the dead. But to my father, he felt like he, he was doing something to pay back his mother. And also my grandma had such a big influence over me. And in a way, she raised me, which is very common in China. If you ask a lot of the Chinese who are here, you ask who raised you a lot of them. It's your grandma that raised you because it's the, the system in China when your parents are at work, the grandma, the grandparents, they step in, especially the male family. Your dad's mother is normally take, took over the responsibility. So that's the, the part that my grandma felt like uh, that the son and the, the grandson, they should have done to fulfill her wish. Also, she felt like she was doing something for us because in the traditional way, if you get, if she was supposed to reunite with her husband, the whole, uh, we would have uh, get blessed from our ancestors because there was a finish, a completion of a, a full cycle. And uh, so in this book, I actually, in a way, throughout the couple, I tried to portray two very strong woman characters in our family. Is one is my mother and my grandmother. They were uh, both born in the year of the tiger. And my dad used to say, <laughs> yeah. and, and then my dad used to say that uh, the Chinese saying that you don't want like, two tigers can never coexist in except one month. They were they just uh, they hated each other. They fought with each other. And uh, uh, because my uh, um, I think you know my my grandmother. She never was married. She was so devoted to my father. I think, you know, looking back, she would never allow another woman almost to take over. Where my, my father, I felt like he, I was just talking to Professor Khan about D.H. Lawrence's sons and lovers, mm -hmm. about the, you know, she, uh, my father felt like her mother was so, had such a so overarching influence. I just th didn't know whether he really actually loved my mother, because there's such a strong influence. And uh, my mother, there was the con the constant conflicts, especially the, the coffin was the one that really uh, ex uh, yeah, exacerbated the whole, the tension. And when my father was devoted, my, my mother wanted, she wanted to go to uh, Shanghai and need a new coat. My, my dad said, we have to save money for my mom's funeral. And that, my, you know, the, 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 the tension. And also sometimes because my grandmother kind of spoiled my my father, my, throughout his whole life, he never knew how to cook. He never knew how to do things. One day I came home, I was really hungry from school, and I said, Dad, I'm really hungry. All my dad knew is said, I'll put a pot of hot water in there. Your mom will be back, and then we'll boil some noodles. <laughs> and keep doing two or three times. That's how he was so spoiled. And then my grandmother, sometimes my mother would just uh, tease my father and give him a hard time. My grandmother just couldn't uh, take that. And uh, so for all her life, in the last days of her life, her things would try to teach me how to cook. So in her words, so I don't have to, I didn't have to put half the crap like a future <laughs> wife. So I remember one night, uh, my grandmother had a, um, uh, I had a fight with somebody, which my grandmother got involved and she felt like she had her high blood pressure. She didn't feel very well, she went to bed early. And then suddenly in the middle of the night, I'm sure we all run into problems with our aging parents. She woke up everybody. She said, uh, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> I want to give the last wish. So my father got so nervous, she, he went out right away to get the doctor. And then uh, uh, we tried to give her some water. And then my grandma said, no, I can't drink water. Because uh, for a dying person, if you drink the water, you get choked. I have to finish my last words. So I went there, knelt in front of her, waiting to hear her last words. I thought she would be saying, I have all this money stacked up for you. <laughs> you know, I was waiting for that whole thing. And then guess what her last words were? Saying, I hope you learn how to cook. <laughs> Remember my words. In this way, you don't have to repeat the same words again. And you don't have to put up with some woman like your mother. <laughs> and, uh, I look around. Luckily, my mother was out. And then, uh, uh, when the doctor came, and the doctor felt uh, her pulse and said, uh, uh, Grandma Huang, you will be able to live to 100. You were just OK. <laughs> And uh, after that work, and then she just uh, went to sleep. And then some sleep board just tried to get over the whole thing. She was uh, snoring. That's what my mother was for the rest. And then this doctor who uh, asked us each, every two months, she would have some kind of episode. 
and the doctor would come over here, fill her pulse, give her some medicine, saying this is good for your blood pressure, good for your this, all your, your illnesses, she would take it. And many years later, I found one time she had an overdose of medicine. I was so nervous, I went to the doctor, I said, what do you give to grandma, what, what's going to happen to her? The doctor said, oh, just have her drink a glass of water, because that's all the vitamins. <laughs> for, for, as, far as, as far as I can remember, in the 1970s, the doctor would give her some vitamins, but she thought it was the, the pill for her illness, for her everything. So that's how the tension, I, I just digressed a little bit to come back to the tension between my mother and uh, my uh, grandmother. And in a way, my grandmother was a very traditional woman. She was, her husband died at the age of 27, and she never, she was never married. And she was called in China with a faithful widow, because in the traditional Confucian way, that if the husband died, the faithful widow would stay and take care of the husband's family. They would never, they would never marry another man. And uh, she raised my father, and uh, on the other end, then during the Cultural Revolution, and even though she was one of the called proletariat, the, the ruling class, and she was helping, um, she was a maid at a certain point. She, she was born in a big family, but in order to raise my dad after the family, she escaped to another city, became a maid so that she can raise my dad. Mm -hmm. And then the, her employer became the, the persecutor. They, they paraded him on the street. They gave the big house to our family. And then my grandma refused to take the house. She said, this is not ours. And then they asked her to go and denounce the, the employer. She didn't want to go. So they sent my dad to go. And then she actually secretly took care of the, the, uh, the employers, the children. So she was this very simple and honest woman. But then she was also very, very traditional. Whereas my mother, her time was the, in the 1950s. And then uh, she was the, they call the new generation of women under communism. And one month after I was born, she left me with my grandmother because she felt that uh, uh, revolution was more important than the family because that was the, it was stigma for people to place family above the revolution. And she left me with my grandmother. She would only come home once a month. That's why for years and years, I never had a normal relationship with my mother. And then until she realized that was, was a mistake, she came back and moved closer to us when I was uh, nine or 10 years old. But then um, it was too late. I felt more attached to my grandmother. And uh, sometimes she, you know, the tension. Because they both tried to, uh, uh, my mother tried to get back her son. My grandmother wouldn't let go, and then sometimes the tension between them, and then they would. My mom would spank me so hard. Sometimes I realized that she was probably getting back my grandmother, and they would start to, to, to fight for many years. And but then my mother, after my father died, everybody expected my mother to be like my grandmother. But she married my my dad's best friend in seven months, and unfortunately. Oh. And that's everybody, our relatives, they wouldn't talk with her, but she, you know, stood, uh, uh, you know, she stood firmly and she moved in with uh, the person. And then, unfortunately, her second husband died a year and a half later of liver cancer. And she actually went out a dating service, which started in China. Because in China right now, it's more for practical purposes, a lot of uh, widows and widowers, they, they, you know, they lived alone, the traditional paper families, they no longer exist. People, they start to encourage people to, to get a second, third marriage. My mom was just leading the, 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 the whole trend, the movement. And uh, she married again the third time. I'm just trying to see the two different, the two different women between my mother and my grandmother, how time has changed. And uh, even though she has similar traits, but they, they totally left different paths. That's the, another thing that the book's trying to convey. And, and if I can explore that a little bit more, in the book around page 223-4, you discuss that sort of rapid change in, in the three generations and all the different thought processes and how much China has changed over the last 80, 90, well now over 100 years. And actually, you know, China has been around just that long, so we've witnessed it from a very different right. um, angle. But it's interesting because your sister is very upset with your mother uh, that she's now gone to date Uncle Ma. Right. As someone that uh, has been relatively close to the family, uh, and that, 
and you, you sort of highlight some of the changes that when, when you were younger, it was you know, forbidden and, and sort of the, the, the punishment you would receive for being seen in public kissing right, or, right. or even just very you know, simple aspects of the uh, public displays of affection uh, were not acceptable. Right. And yet over this short period of time, your mother has, within seven months, you know, remarried to a very close... So, so that, I just thought it was very interesting to see your sister uh, upset with your mother, and yet your mother being the sort of... It's, it's, it's this, it's this uh, sort of uh, switching places in terms of uh, judgment. Right, I think that my sister's reaction is more like everybody else here. It's probably, you are so used to your mother and your own father together. Even it took me a while, you know, suddenly you see your mother with another man. It's the idea, it just, uh, it takes a while to adjust. I remember in the old days when I, even myself, I supported my mother's marriage. I, the only advice I gave her, I said, if you marry somebody else, you should have have him go through a health checkup so that he doesn't, because for a while they, they called my mother with a, uh, I, is there a phrase here called like black widow, or, right? Yeah. It's like men killer or something, my, 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 because, and uh, uh, they actually, you know, way was very sad because my mother used to be in the, in the neighborhood, so each time before someone gets married, they have a lot of women coming here to knit the, their quilt for the bride. It's a very auspicious thing to do. But then, after uh, my mother became a widow, and have, she, uh, they would not allow her to, to do that anymore because you are no longer considered an auspicious person or a symbol to do that. And uh, so she, was, uh, she had that image. But my, from my sister's point of view, even though she was the younger generation, even my brother, right. who had a living girlfriend, they were never married in China before, that was just inconceivable. But, and then he's strongly opposed to my mother's marriage. It's, I think it's, from this, it's, of, to, it's just the irony of it. It's like, they, they, the children themselves, you can do whatever, but when your parents, it's the emotional thing with your, your own parents. And uh, you, you just can't, um, uh, it's hard to see your mother with another, another stranger, with another person. Even for me, when I went home, I would go to my mom's home in the old days, I could take my shoes and then do whatever I want. But when she, I visited her, I felt like, just like I'm sitting here, I felt very nervous sitting there all the time because it's no longer, you no longer feel like uh, it's your home anymore. That, that's kind of the strong reaction of that. But uh, for the book, I also want to, to, to show people the other aspect of Chinese society is when the communists took over China, they that seem to give people the impression that uh, it's a very liberal ideology. Encouraged because Mao used to say, women hold up half of the sky or hold up half of the sky. And women were liberated, they were encouraged to work full time, to leave the home. But to actually, uh, was more draconian and more puritanical than a lot of other countries because when most people here who grew up in China will know that in the 1970s, it was very hard to see if a young person like you holding hands on the streets was, was a considered a very uh, immoral thing. I remember when I was in college and uh, of, um, a person, that was even in the 1980s, 1983, uh, there was a, um, somebody who was uh, two years older. One day, uh, the two of them, they were dating and the one day we, came back from a movie, the door was closed, and we noticed that uh, the girl was inside. And suddenly everybody surrounded was screaming, so what's going on there? And then the political instructor, he was the, the counselor, he came over here, knocked on the door, they, wouldn't, they would not uh, uh, open the door. So the counselor actually climbed up to the window <laughs> and tried to use a rod to, to saw the clothing on, on the scattered, you know, strewn on the, on, the, on, the, on the table. He tried to use the rod to get the, the, the clothes out. So the, uh, the, the person said, um, okay, well, uh, if you just leave us alone, we'll let, we'll let it go. So they, they finally, the, the, the girl actually happened to be uh, with her boyfriend at, at that time. And after they left, they had a whole, the next day, they had a whole department meeting to denounce the act. They even read the love, the love letters that between them. And after graduation in 1984, the two of them, because in China, uh, the government assigned uh, jobs in the old days, 
they deliberately assign, assign the two of them to different places. So it was not possible to show that the, the kind of during the 1980s. But nowadays, you see it's probably going to the other extremes, just like here. You go to the, the streets, you see the half, half you know, those uh, South Porn magazine on the bookstore, and you see younger people, you just, uh, it's just, it's so similar to what is here. But I want to show the changes during that those years. And in Xi'an, probably, uh, Professor Khan wrote a big story about somebody, this woman who taught young people how to dance, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a private dance <coughs> program for intimate dancing. And then she had probably had, tip, Right. And then she had, she also had uh, uh, premarital sex with somebody. And she was executed in 1984, right? Yes. So uh, to show you the, 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 the changes in China during that time, um, but anyway, so that was through my mom's marriage. I tried to give people a glimpse of the changing attitude towards sex in, the, right. in China. I'm so, going to open it up after so, this question. Right. Okay. So if, right, if you were, they would be considered a rascal or a, a hooligan, mm -hmm. and then you could uh, get executed. Right. So, so I'll, I'll open it up after this question. And there are lots of questions in terms of the history during this period of time. Even if you haven't read the book, I think there's quite a bit of insight that one can share on that. Uh, I, have, I have a couple questions, but I'll narrow it down to one, which is more of a, a, a sort of a, a, I'm interested in your personal response. So your, 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 grand, your father passes away November 30th, 19, or no, October 31st, right. 1988. Your grandmother then passes away one year and one month later, later right. on November 30th, 1989. You mentioned that your father visits you quite, quite frequently in your dreams, right. and then, um, and then how you're questioning how that carries over into the real world. And then at the same time, on the day your grandmother died, you said that that thoughts of your grandmother kept coming into your mind. Right. I'm wondering what what connection do you have in terms of thinking through? Was there some sort of connection you had with your father or grandmother that? Do you believe personally that there might be some sense of this sort of um, post-life uh, visits as, as many sort of traditional Chinese superstitions you have that one visits right. um, uh, family members after they pass? Have you thought through that? Yes, actually, um, that's another thing I try to explore in the book. You know, we uh, were born in the 1960s and 70s. It was the atheist communist ideology, everything in the world, you know, is uh, non religious and we didn't have any religion, and then the, our religion is probably the Chinese tradition and superstitions. And as I evolved, I think, you know, sometimes I, uh, uh, I was a very um, progressive activist, both in school and in college, we believe in communism, because partially it's, uh, uh, you have to do it in the com to survive in a communist society. Partially, it's you receive the education, you believe that's the right thing to do to build a, equal society, and this is a world without God. And uh, that's how you, 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 you were taught. And then as years grow by, and then uh, I saw a lot of the funeral arrangements, some of the rituals, and some of the superstitions. You always think they are superstitious. They are old practice. We don't believe in that. And then as you grow older, you suddenly realize you have new perspective on things. And I just realized that sometimes the rituals might be something is not really for the, whether you believe it or not, or it's not really for the dead, but sometimes it's for the living. You feel like this is something at least you can do for the dead. I'll tell you a story later on about what I had to do, the, the changes. But with this, uh, the dream stuff, the superstition stuff, I don't know that happened to me three times in my life, and I still don't know how to explain it. That's why I put it in a way whether there is the special, because the special connection with my grandmother and my father, which I wasn't aware be, uh, before. For example, the, um, the day of my grand, grand uh, my dad passing was I was uh, I was in school, I was in college, and then um, so I had I woke up in the middle of a nightmare, like one of my tooth here, the wisdom tooth, was falling out, was bleeding. So I woke up, and then I asked my, my roommate, I said, is that some, you know, it's Chinese, we all pay a lot of attention to that. <laughs> so this is some kind of a bad omen, and then the, the, the person said, oh, somebody, your family might die. 
I, I just stayed awake. I jotted down the note on um, the journal saying, I hope it's not true. But, so the next morning, in the old, I just went to make a phone call. In those days in Shanghai, we didn't have a phone call at uh, uh, individual homes. If you want, want to make a phone call, you have to go to downtown to a big post office there to make a long distance call. So I made all the all the way to the, to the city and made the phone call. My dad answered, and then uh, he said, oh, I'm okay. I said, what are you doing now? He said, oh, some Catholic ladies just came in to pray for me. They said it's going to work. I said, Dad, you are a Communist Party member. I thought you were going I said, oh, it doesn't matter. Whatever cures me. Because at a certain point, they, they have all kind of tried all kind of things on him. They put a frog on his chest, had lung cancer. They thought they were going to suck the poison out of it, and it didn't work. And then now they had the Catholic ladies went to pray. I said, that's good. So I thought, oh, I went back to my, uh, my roommate. I said, oh, the, the dream is kind of a superstition, superstitious thing, and I just ignored it. And then I went to participate in this uh, uh, Shanghai International Movie Fest. And then I was just watching this movie. Somebody came in with a telegram saying, your dad is dying. Rush home directly. So I took the, the train. That's one. Then when I went home, he was waiting for me. And uh, in the book, I specifically described the, the, the heart-wrenching things in the last days. He, while I was holding him, he passed away. That's one thing. And then uh, my mom was always a believer in the dreams. And the each time I started to have dreams, I started to get scared. And then soon after my, my uh, father died, and then so I just had another dream that my dad just came in from the house wearing the, his uniform. And then he said, I'm going to take grandma away. Then I said, no way. I said, uh, grandma raised me. I have to uh, pay back and then treat her nicely. So my dad said, I'll give you one year. He left. And then I called my mother. I just said, um, uh, mom, I had this dream again. Really scary. My mom said, oh, maybe your dad is just want you to, 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 to take care of her. And it, she said, your sister also had a dream talking about uh, Bringing, uh, buying all kinds of cookies for your grandmother, and uh, I said, "Why is that?" She said, "Oh, you know, people when people die, you buy all these smaller. You don't buy a huge portion; buy three of a kind." So maybe that was, that was it. So I got nervous. I was taking care of my grandmother to try, and then nine and a half months later, my grandma passed away. So this is there was another thing. Of course, my mother. It, after these two things, I just uh, I still can't find a, a solution, an inex inexplicable or whatever. I'm sure some of you will run into some things that uh, you can't explain. I just don't know. I still don't know whether it, maybe it was a coincidence or it was just uh, my mother. She she had all kinds of things. Sometimes it's too much. I just feel like you're too superstitious. <laughs> like we were. I was in Shanghai before she passed away. She would say, "Oh, I had a dream that uh, your dad, your grandmother." Uh, um, moved to a new place because they were buried together and uh, they moved to a new house they didn't even have stairs and uh, I said oh really I never took it seriously and three months later she called me did not tell you that dream and uh, we just got the notice your grandmother they were moving the tomb over <laughs> to a different place so I went to visit and I saw it right up on the hill the road was not even paved so there's something I just uh, because each time I did something, I sometimes take a journal. I just wanted to see how some whether it's correct or not. And there were certain things. Uh, it's just uh, you can't explain. That's why I just try to use that to add more to this. Uh, I guess the supernatural element. Sometimes the connection. I do believe. You know, this is another personal thing. I believe sometimes you don't realize you have a special connection with your parents, even though you have attention with them. <laughs> when you were young, or you think that your parents, you were alienated from them, but there might be some connection you're not aware of that really bonds you together. That's the message I want to get to people. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And let's open up for questions. Any, anything goes, I think, is a, when it's suggested. Yes. Have other members of your family read your book, and what have they thought? Yeah, I ask. Um, luckily, none of them read English. <laughs> and uh, I think I, because I, somebody asked me, say, what are you going to translate into Chinese? I, I, I'm not going to have it translated. First, when it's translated, you have to rewrite it. And there was so much family stuff. I just feel so vulnerable. I feel like 
writing in English in that my mother tongue is kind of protection. You feel like you could detach yourself from it. But for the Chinese to read it, it's just too uh, personal. But my uh, sisters, they provide most of the information. I went, I took my, while writing the book, I took two trips back. We reminisce together because I have a little bit of a photographic memory stuff. When I reach certain things, I, re I remember certain things, what person wears and what happens. But then, you know, everybody's memory, sometimes your perspective is different. So I went back and talked with them, a lot of the information they provided, but I never uh, shared the information. Even my father, I think, if uh, he has read the book, he would be horrified because he was a very intensely private person. My mother used to love to gossip with her girlfriends in the neighborhood. My, uh, my dad used to call her the community radio. <laughs> I, and in case I was just joking, I said, I said, if my dad had read my book, he would call me the national public radio. <laughs> the whole country knows. <laughs> the whole world knows. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, so I was wondering what inspired your interest in public affairs journalism? So much that you would come to the United States to study it. And also, um, working for the I guess, press outlets you had. <coughs> I guess, is there ever a disconnect between the stories you personally like writing about these intergenerational trends and developments and what is typically assigned to you? Um, I'll answer your first question to the public affairs was, um, when I was in China, we, um, in 1986, I studied English literature and uh, I, I was lucky enough to be sent to, I was telling Nancy the reason I don't bring copies, because English literature was too hard and I used to have problems writing, uh, writing English essays. I always waited till the last night. I couldn't get it. I kept drinking coffee. And then after graduation, I said, I will never drink coffee, and I will never do English literature again. <laughs> and then, but I just kind of like writing. And to me, journalism was relatively easy, because you interview other people, and then you, you write down, and then reorganize it. But uh, I was lucky. I was in journalism in 19... 88, that was the time when China, right before Tiananmen Square, and there was a huge movement uh, by the journalists to press for a press law in China. There was the openness, and uh, uh, a lot of some of the papers were, actually a lot of the papers were allowed to write freely for a while, and even the freely, relatively speaking, compared to before. Because in China, we were taught in journalism school that uh, uh, the media, the mouthpiece of the party, that was the, the standard line when you, the first day you know journalism school you read the book that's what you should know and but at that time the first time people started to talk about how journalists as a watchdog I and mean, you can you should monitor uh, you know the, what the party was doing at that time but most person the most things that uh, impressed me was uh, uh, a book called All the Presence Men I'm sure a lot of people in journalism here they were inspired by the same book I was a tour guide. Uh, in Xi'an, and I met this lawyer from New York. Uh, we started chatting, and before he left, he was very grateful because I took him to some places that normal tourists wouldn't go, so he gave me a book called The Presence Man. I read about it. It was kind of very fascinating, so how journalists bring down the president. So I started to nurture this uh, fantasy of doing journalism. And after Tiananmen Square, I was a participant and uh, I applied for a school, and I, ha I happened to be in Springfield, Illinois. There was a program by Senator Paul Simon. Uh, he started this uh, program to train journalists to cover the, uh, the legislature, which I was very interested in. And uh, I was the first international student to be enrolled in the program because it was very local politics. And then that's how I got started in journalism. But now I write for Fortune, sometimes uh, New York Times, and uh, um, uh, some of the pieces. Fortune, I do more of the business side of the stories now. And I do, sometimes I write a lot about intergenerational com conflicts, what's happening now. But a lot of times, uh, you have no choice. The editor said it was really interesting, the story. But luckily, when you become a freelance writer, you can find the topics you're interested in. But it, it is hard to make a living. That's why I have a day job with a uh, corporation. After <laughs> <laughs> this book, uh, I think, I predict this is going to be made into a feature film. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions from the audience?
Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Why did it call it the Little Red God? Mm. Um, actually, the original book was called The Coffin Keeper. Oh. Uh, because they, it was my, my dad, when he asked me to sleep next to a coffin, he told me I was the coffin keeper because in the end, I was supposed to lead the procession during the funeral as the eldest son. But my editor thought that you can't give a book during Christmas time to somebody saying, here's a book called a coffin keeper. <laughs> I said, okay, let's come up with an uh, uh, auspicious name. I said, if you could have red in there, that would be great. So we started experimenting. Red dragon, uh, uh, something on the dragon, something. And then we didn't come up and, uh, with any one that would attract attention. And then the publisher felt like uh, it's called the Little Red Guard because when I was a child, I was a Little Red Guard. My father told me to. Uh, sleep next to a coffin it was the part about the conflicts. So that's why we called it the name. I hesitated a little bit because I didn't want people to see this as a political book or this is a cultural revolution book. This is, was a family book. But uh, I guess, uh, but what I depicted in the book is also happening during the cultural revolution. And the red, I hope, uh, will bring a lot of luck to the book because. Uh, it's the year of the dragon, it's also my birthday year, and then we have to wear and uh, wear the <laughs> wear everything red. I did a story on PR, I got a lot of calls because if your birthday year, remember here, if your birthday year and you always should wear a red underwear. And then you China you go there, you ask people, you say, I want to buy a red uh, birthday year underwear. They sell it. I bought a lot of uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the thing. It's supposed to the redness, or you wear something red. It's supposed to, the redness is supposed to bring you good luck and ward off your unexpected disasters, especially when you travel. That's the the, the thing. Somebody joked with me because they call me when. They said, "Why do you start a birthday of underwear?" More questions from the chair. And yes, um, I I've spent really 30 years of, of my life in Xi'an, so I, I cannot wait to read more of, of your you. stories. But you, um, I, in just the reviews, I saw that your father's ashes were buried in the coffin right. with your mother. Right. Um, in the uh, early 80s, I developed a very close friendship with the Wong family in okay. Xi'an. Okay. Uh, same situation where they so wanted, he so wanted to have a, a burial. And the teachers would come and teach him about the communist way that you, you can't have the, the burials. So in his house, in just this one, he, he only had two rooms, um, there was the coffin covered by the uh, uh, <coughs> green oil cloth. Right. Um, and it was for Lao uh, Wong. Right. But there was also, this is Wong. And we became very close, but I never asked what happens if he dies and he is buried, what happens to her? Because there was only one coffin. <laughs> so do you have thoughts on how they might have handled that? <laughs> because normally during that, uh, within a family, as far as my understanding, it's more, mostly for the man, for the father. And then whoever dies first has a coffin. Because you don't get uh, two coffins, right? You normally have one coffin, and the next one goes after that. That's normally the one. And normally people uh, pay a lot of attention to their father. It's like the, the head of the family right. and the coffin. Because I just, somebody read my book. I was so inspired, told me a story. She was from Taiwan. Uh, in 1949, uh, her father had to leave China, mainland China, to go to Taiwan. He knew that it would be many years before he could return to mainland. So he didn't know what to get for his dad. So what he did was he bought a coffin for his dad. <laughs> That was the, he felt like that was the best he could do. It was like the best gift. Can you believe that was the, you believe your father, you said, Father, I will never probably come back in 30 years. Here's a coffin. That was considered the, uh, a thing that he could do. And then he, uh, many years later, they gave the coffin to a relative. And he was so upset he, over this because he felt like that was the thing, the best he could do for his father. More questions from the audience? You mentioned two reasons you, you wrote this book in, in the um, after and the afterward. Uh, one, you're to deal with the foolish reticence at your father's funeral in uh, 1988, 
and then also to rescue an obscure family story. Uh, and thinking through just the family nature of this and, and your uh, relationship with your family and, and your siblings and your parents, was this therapeutic uh, to, to write? Was it, was it, how did you feel after finishing the last sentence in this book? Was it cathartic? Or how, how it is very cathartic. It's like a cleansing process because it stayed with me for years. I've told the story about, um, um, probably some of you have heard, some of you have not the reason, it's a personal reason I wanted to write a book. It was in 1988, my father died of a lung cancer. He was 58. And I was a college, uh, I just graduated from college, and uh, I was a university teacher. You know, I was young and arrogant, and then thinking I knew everything. And uh, then, uh, after he died, the party secretary came in and said, uh, you need to, you are the eldest son, and you've been to college, a prestigious college in China, and you need to say a few words about your father after the eulogy. And uh, I said, okay. After, I, after he said that, I, you know, you were young, you were trying to, I said, I have to deliver a beautiful eulogy to impress everybody because I was the only one who been to college. And then uh, as the, the hours was approaching, and I found out that I had problems writing the, was saying what I, about my father. So I looked at his life, and I felt like there was really not, nothing worth talking about. I, I said, you know, he used to be a cultural official, and then he, for years, he offended the party secretary, and then he lost his job, and he worked in the factory, a warehouse manager for years, and then the only co accomplishment he had was my grandma's coffin. He spent the, many years preparing for it, he died before my grandmother. So the more I thought about it, I felt very bitter, and I just couldn't uh, uh, say anything. And then I said, maybe at the last minute, inspiration will hit me. And then the funeral started. I went to, the, uh, the whole family went in there. And then I was very surprised that 400 some people showed up. I said, a lot of people came up to say, oh, your father was a very nice person. Uh, he helped me. That. And then I was a little bit, I was a little bit shocked that my father would have so many friends who would come. And then uh, I was struggling with words. And then suddenly uh, the eulogy was supposed to be long. I felt very short that day. And suddenly the, the, they, they said, oh, the, the son of uh, Mr. Huang Zhiyu is coming to say something. My mind totally went blank. I just uh, went on the stage and uh, I looked at everybody. I bowed three times. I just said, thank you. And I could hear the, the silence. Nobody uh, said anything. Everybody looked at me, and the party secretary was a little stunned. And then he immediately said, "Oh, now let's do the wake and walk around the the the, uh, the glass, uh, the coffin, and then before the cremation." So I just didn't know what happened later. And then you know how mothers are. She never allowed me forget my shame. For the past uh, after my father's death, each time she said to that. That has never happened to anybody at the funeral. She was telling me that I went to this funeral of so and so. The son has never even been to college. She always emphasized she's never been to college, but delivered these things about the father made everybody cry. And then she would tell me, Oh, I went to another funeral. So and so. She didn't say a word, but she sang the famous opera of her father, and she made everybody cry. So it's just always the guilt there. And uh, later on, I realized that it was really, uh, in the whole area, they had a lot of funerals. Normally, nobody has done what I did. Like, you know, you never didn't have anything to say about my father. And after my mother passed away in 2005, and uh, suddenly the guilt was such that I felt like uh, maybe I owed my father um, a eulogy. That, and then as I grow older, when I turn 40s, I realize that more and more the things that I rejected from my father, the things he taught me when I was a young person, and start to make sense. Because when I came to the U.S., I said the first thing I want to do is do something totally different from my father. I want to be a totally different person. But then as you grow older, you just realize you are your father, right? Just like you are turning your mother. And then I was talking to Professor Khan, he said, 
right now it seems like he has the invisible hands like guiding me everything and you act like your father I went back people said you look just like your father which you got hated but then, but then and then you, you, you just started to develop this uh, thing you start to appreciate what he you know your, your own father I'm sure we all gone through the same thing and I decided to revisit his life and the more I have this appreciation and while I was trying to write about his stuff, now I said, what am I going to write? So I, I tried, I couldn't sleep for about three weeks. Every night I started to, to, to think about what happened in the past, the old memories started to come back. I would stay up till four or five o'clock. And then, uh, then I said, what is the main theme? So I decided to write about the coffin because it had such a big impact on my life. And once you find the, the theme, it took me a month and a half to finish the book, the first draft, and then I started to, 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 to finish it, and after I finished it, and I was talking about the rituals early on, why I want to mention that, and uh, so uh, Penguin picked up the book, and they decided to, to publish it, and in, uh, in April, I had the first copy of the galley, and I had a very strong urge to go visit his tomb, it's almost like when a kid when you get a good grade, you want to show off to your dad. So what I did was in, uh, in February, late February, I took a trip. I got my first copy of the book. So I went uh, to visit Tian. I went home and uh, I went to the tomb. They said, uh, my sister said, oh, you normally don't visit until the Memorial Day the festival in April. I said, no, I have to go. So I brought the book with me. I was originally, I just went up there, I did a talk, I just said, I'm sorry, you know, that part, and then uh, I finally write the book, now everybody's going to know about your life. So I put it on there, and I was about to leave, I called my sister, I said, oh, I feel so relieved I finally gave the book to dad. And then my sister said, no, 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 the Chinese tradition says that you have to burn it in order, to, in order for him to read it. You just put it there, it's for the, the living. I said, what do I do? I don't even have a cigarette lighter. So I went down, I went down the hill and got the cigarette lighter from the driver. And uh, I borrowed the, the, the driver uh, uh, and I just started to, to, to uh, set it on fire. It was drizzling. And if you notice, whoever burned books, you know, it's very hard actually. <laughs> and I, I did this, I tried and tried, and then finally the cover went off. And then the, the, the middle wouldn't go, so I just assume I ran out of the, the original it was the, the, the look in there. And it wouldn't go, I just said, well, I just called my sister again, I said, I guess it just wouldn't uh, uh, go. Father, I just joked and I said, as father doesn't read English. <laughs> and my sister, just try one more time, it doesn't work, just put it on there, when we go there in April, we'll help you burn the things. So I just decided to, to, to try one more time, I was doing this. As I was frustratingly trying to, to, to light it a couple more times, now I just I was so frustrated I lifted it up and then a gust of wind came. And so miraculously the, the pages just started the book became like this and the fire just like this. Just like this. And uh, it was the very mysterious and then uh, I looked around and I said, Wow. He must really like the book. Because I think this comes to the fact about the superstition. You know, when, when you were, when I was young, I would think it's so ludicrous. You believe something, you buy a book, you think you send a book, you think the dad is reading it, right? You just interpret it the way you want. But on that day, I have to say that it's very soothing. That's how I suddenly started to come to the understanding. Sometimes when all we all have to go to do some silly things or crazy things for the, for different rituals or go to a funeral or go to a wedding or go to something and you you do all kinds of rituals, I just realized it's really not for the other person rather than for ourselves. It's, uh, you feel like you have done something. I guess for me, I felt like I didn't do the speech and finally the book burned like this. He really probably likes the book. So that was... Uh, and can we finish with the reading? Would you mind reading a passage from your book for the audience? And then we'll have uh, individual conversations and anyone who's interested can have when sign the book and then you can purchase a copy. Would you mind doing that? Sure. I'll just try not to keep you long. Do a very short paragraph. 
Why do I write about Shia? How many people have been to Shia? <laughs> oh, great. I don't have the license, but I just have my circle. Okay. Let me just, let me just uh, I'll just read a paragraph of my, what, what I, uh, if I can't do it, probably, I hope you can read the afterword.
Seventy-nine of them were buried in and around Xi'an. Emperors would begin scouting for auspicious locations for their burial as soon as they assumed power, and work would begin almost immediately on their tombs, the interior of which resembled a palace, so they could enjoy the same glory and luxury in their afterlives. Empress Wu Zetian of the Tang Dynasty spent 23 years building her tombs. A legend has it that her accession was because the location of her husband's tomb, which was shaped in, which nestled between two hills and resembled a woman's breast, and hence a powerful source of the female energy. In March 1975, while digging a well, some farmers outside Xi'an found what looked like a piece of large statue. They reported what they had found, and further investigation revealed that the buried army of terracotta warriors and the tomb of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of unified China. In that year, father, a big fan of Asian Chinese history, took me on company-organized trips to see the recent discovery that's now part of the world's cultural heritage. He said the emperor, oh, my eyes started the survey. The emperor started building his tomb at the age of 13. Sorry, I just had my eye surgery. Suddenly, when I started reading, it started. 700,000 workers labored 38 years to build it. Historians believe the tomb of Shi Huang Di, which has been sealed, was an exact replica of the, her, his palace and contains a treasure of unimaginable value. Many of the key builders and craftsmen were buried alive inside the tomb to protect the secret passages. That story, I had nightmares for years. Oh, sorry, I can't speak. That's wonderful, yeah. No, I, I just said the, the second half of the story, which is trying to tell that uh, when I went back to, sorry, I just had the eye surgery and then make me uh, have tears. It's not like I was so overwhelmed. No, I took a trip to Xi'an. What really amazed me was uh, uh, that uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and then the Red Guards, they destroyed a lot of the, the Asian rallies in Xi'an in the name of the revolution. And, uh, but still, Xi'an was controlled by a lot of the conservatives, because with, like the Midwesterners, they had more of a common sensibility, they protected a lot of the treasures. And also, the first emperor of China was a big favorite, Chairman Mao. He believed that he was a, he unified China. So we managed to keep some of the old buildings and then the architectural stuff. <coughs> if you were in Xi'an in the 1970s, you could still see something. And then during the recent years, that w what I felt very sad is that uh, people now, in the name of restoring the past, and in Xi'an started, I know a lot of Xi'an here, they started to build these town palaces, which, you know, building the, age, the place where the town palaces used to be the hand palaces. And then when you go in there, I don't know, have you ever seen one of those? You, if you go in there, they look like a Di Disney World. Brand new and the shiny construction work, very gaudy, you know, gaudy mm -hmm. stuff, the red painting, the new painting. You don't feel a sense of history at all. In the downtown Xi'an, where used to be a lot of the beautiful houses, right now the cinder block buildings, you have Rolex, uh, Chanel, all these big ads. And then in the, the, even the, the city wall, which the city uh, is very proud of, you can see it's brand new. They just built it and the pollution because people are driving cars. Uh, grandma's tomb has to be relocated three times because each time you relocate somewhere and then there's a new construction building. And even the, my, uh, the same thing is happening in my hometown. My grandmother wanted to be taken back to her native village and now they try to build some Tai Chi museum and I couldn't even find the, the, the cemetery. In the book, I have to try and say, in the old days, cemeteries, to me, a lot of it, it was the, the link between your ancestors and your past. And right now, it's both the living and the dead. You have to make room for development. Mm -hmm. To me, that's very sad. China's in the, you have this huge history. People, in the name of restoring history, you are destroying a lot of stuff. Some of them is not even uh, recoverable. And I just feel very, sad in a way that uh, even though my grandma, the whole story in the old days, the traditional value is that no matter how
prosperous you are, the whole family has to stay together. When you die, you have to go back to, to your hometown. And nowadays, it's, you can't even find your hometown. <laughs> and uh, everybody is changing so fast. And uh, because in the old days, my dad used to say, the curse on the person is that people say, is I'm going to dig up your ancestry tombs. That's the, the very insulting thing to say. But nowadays, you there is no, they are digging up the, the ancestry. <laughs> right. So that's what the, 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 my comment about Xi'an is. And they are, I just wish that, I guess everybody, every country, in order to reach a certain state of maturity, you all have to go through this destruction, destructive stage. But I just hope they, they will soon realize it and then to reconnect with our past. Otherwise, it would be a big regret for me to lose that part of the Chinese history. And then just one thought, if you go to France, somebody, I talked to me yesterday, they said you can find a winery. They said, oh, it was built in 1600 and we've been kept this, blah, blah, blah. You go to China, you cannot find a restaurant that said it's been here for 100 years. You can't probably even find somewhere for 20 or 30 years. It just shows you the whole, the development is going on, modernization is going on, but uh, how do we strike a balance? That's the book. Wonderful. And, and what a wonderful universal humanist. China Association. We have a book that you know started in 1901. Uh, just a little bit of our history uh, for you as a small gesture of our appreciation. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this time with us and also for uh, putting together such a gift to us in terms of the China's modern history from a very unique and special and personal uh, perspective. We really are very grateful. And just thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, signed books, and we're giving a special offer, two for 30. So if you purchase Wen's book, you will also get this wonderful uh, Centennial History of Yale, China, and those proceeds will go to our work. Uh, so, but uh, thank you so much. If you'll sign over there, please. It's a wonderful book. It has a lot of different uh, insightful aspects. And also thanks to Woodbreed.